Welcome to Walklings, a podcast about art, creativity and nature. I'm your host, Lucia Para, Italian artist, illustrator and children educator with the Reggio Emilia approach. And in this season, I talk with inspirational creatives who grow the arts, with children and young people. Welcome. Welcome to episode 4, where I interview Oliver Wallace from Patch Larks. It is not really easy to introduce Oliver because he's so many things, and perhaps the best word I think could be magical. In this interview, we talk about so many things, from the deep pedagogical roots that are behind something that looks so simple, like telling a story to be so brave to follow our own curiosity and leave our own world with imagination, in doing so making our life and the life of the people around us more rich. We also talk about trusting the process and how to bring our playful but at the same time skillful adults into play when we work with children. And so now, let's welcome Oliver Wallace. Okay, welcome to Oaklings, and we have today Oliver from Patchlarks today. And so Hello. Welcome, Oliver. Hi, <laughs> sorry, I jumped in there. <laughs> Fantastic, no worries. It's yeah. really windy on the Isle of Wight, and so I hope our listeners can hear us okay. And mm-hmm. I don't know, where are you at the moment? I'm in my little studio in North London, um, in Turnpike Lane in Haringey, and the, I can see the tops of the London plane trees, the iconic London plane trees, okay. and they're just currently getting well watered by this fresh autumn rain. <laughs> yes, so we had it in this morning. I was drawing children at the forest school, and I, I thought, oh, I might need to get some waterproof paper. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. So I normally like to start uh, these interviews by saying to our listeners, how did I come to know about my guest? Mm -hmm. And in your case, I was interviewing Deborah Curtis from the House of Fairy Tales and the Great Imagining. And when I came to the question that is, who do you think we should not miss to interview? (laughs) One of the people she listed, it was you. Mm. And... Yes, and she mentioned she mentioned mini forest narrative adventures, and I said, "Wait, uh, I need to know about that." <laughs> yes, I don't know. Maybe my listeners know already that I'm really a, like an Underwood person. I think I must have spent few past lives in the Underwood somewhere. So mini forest sounds like. But before, just before we talk about that, if you don't mind, I w- would like to ask you if you can introduce yourself and just tell us a little bit about how the journey of working for and with children started for you and of course what patch larks is about mm, okay well um i'm an artist and a storyteller and uh in the past i've been a theater maker uh and oh lots of questions all at once my brain is catching up with them uh yeah i've been doing that for about 13 years Um, and actually, I know Deborah Curtis very well because for about 10 of those, I worked as the lead creative at the House of Fairy Tales, making projects with them, big uh, narrative adventures with them. And I'm sure you've heard all about those from that interview. Um, but uh, and, and in 2019, I started my own uh, company called Patchlarks. Um, and that was so that I could kind of, well, the House of Fairy Tales has stopped m- making so many works with children and, 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 uh, that's really my focus. So a lot, so I have made work for adults, um, and I continue to do that. I find that really rewarding, but I have a big focus on primary school age children. Um, I work, I've worked with those, yeah, most of my career and uh yeah with patch larks there's a there's a big focus on imagination and agency bringing agency uh through stories to children so that they feel like they have a um a way of affecting 
their world. And that kind of comes into this very like poignant focus because the story encapsulates ways that they can change the course of the narrative and the way that they can participate and build things within it for themselves. Um, yeah. And um, we we do things all over the country. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> why do you think, is there, I don't know if maybe there is not an answer to this, but why do you think you're drawn to children? And especially you were quite clear about the age that you like to work with. Mm. Is there a reason, do you think? Well, I think uh, it's a good question. I have found that, the, well, okay, so I have four younger siblings and my youngest sibling is 14 years younger than I am. And I've always made games for them and told stories for them um, and kind of led the way of imaginative play with them and as co a collaborator with them. And I think that kind of growing up in that hubbub of making and creating and dreaming um, like has fed through and has always been there. Um, and I went away and studied architecture and then I realized that working in an office all the time was not what I wanted to do. And I spent some time kind of fishing around trying to find something and 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 then I, I found the House of Fairy Tales and I realized that it was this, making, making constructing things still and kind of this, uh, bringing that architectural thinking through, but like constructing narratives, which become spaces for play. And that age group, the primary age group, there's just so much access to um, uh, a real spirit of curiosity and wonder and when as an when when and there's so much a liveliness of imagination but it's also um super valuable i think when when that imagination gets taken seriously by by adults and when the children experience that sense that uh, what they have to say and the way that they can see the world is um is really being Mm, valued and honored and taken seriously and i and i feel like i had experiences at that age and i and i don't have clear memories of that age particularly but i have a sense of of having these experiences where my imagination was honored by adults who were still playful and that that was a huge kind of value for me and really kind of like i don't know led me to have a a relationship to wonder and curiosity as an adult and i want to like bring that alive for, ki for kids at that age yeah yeah i can definitely see that when children have playful adults around either their parents especially i think their parents but even their teachers it gives them mm. confidence even body confidence com emotional confidence all sorts and so mm. i think uh, it's something really not to be dismissed but i really like what you said about somehow the world of architecture didn't really leave you it just you bring something with you about that mm -hmm. what is that can you just expand a little bit on that because i really value the ideas that we never do like wrong choices or it always brings us to be who you are whatever choices we do yeah absolutely you have all these layers upon layers upon layers and you yeah there's no point kind of thinking oh i should have done something else but um the architecture uh i mean it's 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 a, a beautiful subject in that it inc incorporates the aesthetic and the practical and the philosophical and the sociological and you're trying to pull all of those things together and and make something uh, make an idea or make a concept that that could really exist in the world and that could really give a way uh, like help the people who experience it to be in the world in a way that is um full of prosperity for them uh that's i think what architectures uh, architects are trying to, <clears throat> the architects that i was really interested in were trying to do was to pull all those things together and i think that's still like thinking about the projects that i make from all these different perspectives to have this like made a made quality and an aesthetic quality and um and a and a and a um yeah conceptual quality and a, and and trying to draw in ideas of how it is to uh 
live well with the world and be for and and kind of move into the skills that give us prosperity and curiosity and imagination and kindness and all of these things that are getting and community i think there's a i don't know there's a lot of parallels there for me in mm-hmm. the attempt at like bringing something complicated into into something that really uh ex- exists in this moment um and i think yeah there's something there like yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I kind of t- I tend to think of architects a little bit like creators of world worlds mm. like you know they have as you said there is this practical almost like people that invent like Tolkien you know, or people that invent this they are architects in the sense because they bring to reality something that has been imagined and it takes mm-hmm. in consideration as you said aesthetic and thoughts and the people mm-hmm. that are going to be part of it so mm-hmm. definitely I think there's a lot in common between creations of words which you can do with words instead mm. of saying 3d <laughs> models you just can use your words you know just writing and st- as you do storytelling totally and i and 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 i work always in a in a very live way or or pretty much always in a live way so uh not with like recorded content but with content that's happening in the world and not with something that's on uh railway tracks with a very strictly scripted content but with something that's alive and in that way it's like creating a space and a space in which people can interact and there's there's things that have been brought into the space to make it have us you know in be playful in certain directions and certain ways and the net the story is a part of that space building and the props and the sets and the aesthetic of that part of that space building and then once the space is there it's about like it's about responding to who shows up and what they're bringing with them and in that way it's quite kind of yeah it's quite architectural <laughs> if that's not too uh <laughs> that's not too uh high like concepty but yeah that's how i think about it often mm. Yeah, that is interesting because sometimes, I mean, we're already dividing the storytelling that is when somebody sits down like a grandpa or something, tells a story and everyone else is sitting there listening. And that's one type of storytelling. But we are talking about another type of storytelling, which you perhaps call more interactive, where you Mm. perhaps know where you begin, but you don't know where you end. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. And I wonder if this can be exciting, but a bit scary for you that you make it happen. Uh, I don't find it scary at all, actually. <laughs> I mean, sometimes, but then everything's scary sometimes, doesn't it? <laughs> but um, no, it's completely uh, thrilling. I was just at the weekend. Uh, I have a character called the Wandering Wanderer. So they wander about and wander about the things that they find. And where wherever they go, they're looking for stories. They're seeking stories, but they can't make the. St- I can't make the story on my own as the wandering wanderer. I need collaborators, and so it's this character that shows up to events, and I, and I, and I gather a group of kids together. We're going to try and find a story. Can, can someone help? And then we just look. Is it this? Is it to do with your T-shirt? Is it this blade of grass on the ground? Is it that? Oh, it's that bird. Okay, it must be to do with that bird, and and something out of that. And there's a real um, comfort in trusting that if we just keep going and we use like pleasure and and as our guide and curiosity as our guide and a few little tricks that i've gathered along the way we will find something that everybody uh feels a part of and feels joy in and yeah there'll be something that will emerge and that's there's a real like far from being scary there's a real comfort in that like this idea that actually wherever you are if you show up and you really you just you really show up then something will emerge out of that scenario And that's very, that's like a very lightweight thing that I do. And then also there's, you know, there've been things in the past where creating those spaces has been more complex um, with bigger projects. Uh, Yeah. Um, I really like when you mentioned the fact that the trust in the pro, it's basically the trust in the process, isn't it? mm. And um, I can get, I, I feel when I work with children, when they get to about an age like primary school age, they, they because of the life that they are involved in, especially in the school environment, they kind of lose the sense. It's easy to lose the sense of trust in the process because we start already to focus on the product. And, I, and so I really like that what you just said, the comforting that you can do something is not what is 
but it's the doing. And I think if you can embody that somehow experiences as a fun thing to be in there, I think it's really rewarding for a child to take part in these experiences. Mm, yeah, yes, definitely. There's, um, uh, oh, my brain's just gone blank now. Um, but so, uh, anyway, that thought's gone away. And then, <laughs> but there's a, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I was wondering if you can give us a, yeah, you just gave us an example, actually, of a possible way in which you do this interactive storytelling. But I wonder in this bigger project you were talking about, if there is any examples that you can uh, like show us of how do you work in this interactive storytelling way? So um, there, are a couple of, there were a couple of projects that I was thinking about before, you know, before we spoke. Um, and well, maybe one is the is a project that I made with a, a dear friend and collaborator um, called Tim Godwin, who has his own company called Thrift, and we made a project called Terence to the Moon, and it's about this tiny mouse who's a super intelligent storytelling mouse, and we show up to the to the to a school. Uh, so this project took place in a school. It took place over eleven days. Um, in kind of chunk in in kind of groups of three or four days and then over a few weeks this story would keep appearing in the school um we met this mouse called T terence who comes to tell the kids some stories and then we open up his little house which is inside a suitcase and he's not there and 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 we don't know where he's gone and suddenly everything that the you know we showed up to do is in disarray because we were supposed to be just presenting this mouse and now it can't happen and and we, we need help so so suddenly the the children have to help us because they're they're we, we you know our expertise is punctured by the fact that it's gone wrong and the, and and then we get this transmission as the video transmission um of terence and he's this little plastic mouse oh my goodness <laughs> but he's in space and he's gone to fix the moon because the moon's broken, whatever that means. And the all wonder comes from the moon. And um, and he's off on his journey. And from that point forwards, uh, Tim and I were every every day working with groups of children to respond to the things that Terence was experiencing as he flew towards the moon and wondering where he was or what he was doing or how we could help him. And he often needed imaginative inputs, like how can I make friends with this alien creature I've just met that doesn't speak our language? And then how could we make an event that means they become friends? That kind of thing. And then every day, because because we didn't know what the children were going to bring, every evening we would think, well, what? okay, that's just happened. What needs to happen next? And cr And respond and create the next part of the story in response to that. And it wormed its way eventually Terence came back uh, and accidentally got swallowed by a giant, but it was a story giant. And we unraveled the story with this amazing kind of song and it, the giant unraveled and then Terence reappeared and, and the children went crazy and, and had a wonderful kind of finale. <laughs> but we didn't... Massively, sorry, it was just sorry. massively child-led. Yes. It? Yeah. Um, totally and, and and but not kind of denying the uh the value of having some real expert adults who are able to, to catch the inputs and turn them into something more spectacular or more beautiful or, or more cogent more um more intelligent more legible than the children could create on their own and i think it's then you become a collaborator and you don't pretend that you're you as a, as an artist, you're coming to meet the children, and not pretending that you don't have the skills that you have, so that it's all handed over to them. But but being honestly bringing those skills and meeting what they have to offer, which are these amazing ideas and strange ideas, and becoming a collaborator where something like more beautiful than anyone could have imagined is able to emerge out of that sort of alchemy of those two things meeting. Yeah, I like the fact that. There's uh, there's a hon there's honesty 
honesty and it's not just pretend and so everything is pretend and in storytelling I normally start my sessions with the children with a picture book of my collection because being an artist I always collect these books for mm. art and stories and I always believe that it sets the tone to possibilities because all of a sudden when you go into a picture book things become possible, facts become possibilities. And then you are stepping, you're just in the middle of two worlds and you are the only person that decides how much you want to go in one and how much you want to stay in the other. Mm. I think that choice is really important as well. And and especially, that's another thing I love about this age group is that they're discovering um, that they are able, they're, they're, they're learning to distinguish or discern what's real and what's not real. And they go through these great phases of like rejecting the imaginary and then or then welcoming back in. And um, I had this lovely experience with a kid who on that sort of about this. I, I, I'd i made a project in which a giant egg had appeared out of the ground, huge egg, six foot tall. And um, and we were investigating in all kinds of strange, mysterious ways. And I don't know if you've come across, but um with chicken egg, if you shine a bright light behind it, you can see the the embryo uh, developing inside, and and that's how uh, chicken farmers used to check if it had been fertilized or not. You can shine. So we had this kind of. I had the chart of the chicken egg candling chart to show all the different stages with the light shining behind, and then I had a video that I'd made of as if we were seeing inside this giant egg, and. And it was just made out of um, packaging chips and plastic bags and things with a pink light shone onto it and then a tube so I could blow into one of the plastic bags and make the whole thing move. And I just shot this kind of very DIY video. It looked mysterious, but also if you really concentrated, you could tell what it was. And I was stood with this nine-year-old boy and we were looking at it and taking it quite seriously. We were watching this big video and I said, oh, what stage of development do you think this giant egg is at? Let's look at this chart, the chicken egg chart, and compare. And what do you think that is? And I pointed at a part of the video that was moving, and he looked at it, and he went, it looks like a plastic bag. <laughs> and then he looked at me, and I looked at him, and I saw in his eyes that he saw that I knew that he knew what it really what that you know that it really was a plastic bag he saw that i knew it was a plastic bag and that i'd seen that he knew that i knew that he knew that it was a plastic bag and then there was a this unspoken moment where he had to decide you know i wasn't going to tell him no uh, he had to decide and he looked at me and he he said or it could be this <laughs> And he decided to step back into the story. You know, he chose that, you know, and I think that that's really nice as well. Not like not pushing and pulling in and out of the story, but letting the kids decide where they are. Yes. Within it or outside it. And, and that, that, did, that you, agency. Yeah. You, you just acted like a mirror rather than like, you know, a judging person. Mm. That's, that's really powerful. And not holding your own creation too tightly of like, oh, no, you're going to break my creation. It's like, oh, well, we're collaborators here. What do you want to do? Kind of. Yeah. Uh, this is that's important. Important. I think working with children, this type of situation happen more often than we actually think. And 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 we don't have time normally to think mm. much when these things happen. You almost have to act instinctively or else you have to have thought it through before and made mm. your decisions about it because they can happen really quickly and it just and genuinely they can follow you, that they can feel as well. Mm. I mean as anyone else could feel what was you know, if you were pretending or not somehow. <laughs> totally. And I and you were absolutely right. You don't have time to to think it through and react in the moment. And I, I think it's very useful to have like axioms that you live by, you know, that you bring in, in like, I always say you've got to meet, you, uh, you've got to meet kids where, where they are, you know, and that's a kind of, uh, I don't know what that sentence means, but it helps me know how to respond 
in those moments or you know to have these kind of phrases that you carry in your head that like are a shortcut to oh this is how I react yes and uh, I was wondering if the for example when you need inspiration um is there are there some figures in e if alive or not alive in the art world or in other type of creative worlds that you tend to gravitate around? Yes, <laughs> so many. I was thinking, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I was actually just watching some videos, uh, interviews with uh, the comic book maker Linda Barry, who's an American comic book maker. It has fantastic attitude to creativity her style is very um uh maximalist and quite um naive i think she she probably can draw very skillfully and she, i mean hang on but i don't know how to describe it. she could probably draw more realistically than most of the time that she draws but she draws these very kind of simple figures that are extremely expressive and she works a lot with the idea of um as we grow up we think we can't draw anymore or we think we can't make things anymore because we can't do it in a certain way um and she loves to un unpick that and come back to the idea of like making as a way of thinking and not really about the result or the result will come from that process of thinking um but that actually like making just creativity can be this kind of mode of thinking that's really, really useful. It's really just beautiful, wonderful uh, artworks that she makes. And then there's a lot, a, a lot of others. <laughs> I often come to this, um, there's a, uh, the social theorist, the philosopher Hannah Arendt, who, um, who was working, who was writing a lot after the second world war. Um, And she has this uh, <laughs> quote, this quote that lives in my head as um, as one of these phrases, actually, that um, and I'm probably going to misquote it. But anyway, here we go. Uh, she says, um, uh, storytelling has the power to reveal meaning without making the mistake of defining it. And I think that that's, you know, that's a really her kind of attitude to to um our imaginative world was really beautiful or the way that the, the way that our imaginative world actually really has an impact on on how we can interact with the the world around us i think that's yes. something there yeah yeah i'll make sure to put these names i actually don't know any of these two so i'm curious myself to go and have a look. <laughs> I definitely agree with you because, for example, just the other day I was making a workshop, I was learning something, and then for lunch break I went out, and on the other side of the road there was a Christmas shop. And mm. I thought, oh, I go, it's open. I, I, I went in, and the owner of this shop, he actually creates Santa Claus magazines and books, but he makes them so attentive to detail and almost like Dickensian slash Tolkien, Tolkien looking that mm. I started opening them and I just jumped completely into another world, which is easy <laughs> for me in a way. But, you know, it was so immersive, this experience, so well created, that when I stepped out again in the world, I was not the same person that when I went in. Mm. So I can definitely say that it's true, that the imaginative world brings you in the reality in a different way. Mm, definitely, yeah. Yeah, or opens up doors to a new way of uh, a window, a new kind of window into how to think about the world or how to be with the world. Yeah, I was I was just recently telling uh, some folk tales as part of uh, um, a big culture fair in in London. Here we we just had the the revival of the Bartholomew Fair, which um, was a a fair which took place for 700 years in London and then in the 1880s, I think, it was uh, closed down permanently. Um, but they've, And they've just brought it back this this year as a kind of celebration of creativity in, in London. And I was telling some stories as part of that. And one of them was about the fairy midwife. And the fairy midwife is a story that you find all over the UK. Uh, 
about a woman who who helps a, a fairy family give birth, and they and they they tell her that she must wipe an ointment on onto the child's eyes, a special ointment that they give her, but that she mustn't use it herself. And then of course they leave, and she she tries it in one eye, and and then and then as soon as she tries it, she can see the world of fairy. She can see this kind of fairy that actually she these aren't ordinary people that she's been helping their fairies. And as she's going through her life, she suddenly sees the world of fairy all around her. And and then this adventure kind of ensues from there. And I think there's something there, like actually we when when we're working with children, one of our responsibilities is to apply that ointment <laughs> and let them see the world. It, let them imagine that there's a world beyond this world that, that that they can play within, that they can experience. Yeah. It come back to comes back to the idea of agency because then you can decide to see your own life, your own daily life, in this way, in that way, or somewhere in between. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I um uh I used to do a, a um a workshop called cloaking and it's this very quick dressing up again i used to do this with tim godwin who i mentioned before where we create very rapidly create characters with the kids um and um and it was fantastic to see that because we'd created this world of a, of a story that we're all living within the normal go-to characters that are may would maybe be drawn in for these kids from like computer games or films or from the world of sport or from fashion or whatever it was if they if they were kind of like within the bubble of the narrative those things were outside of it and so they they didn't go there and they would come up with these incredible strange uh you know captain hufflepuff and he's like but you know all these kind of wonderful characters where they could try and you get these boys who maybe are quite like football focused creating these kind of feminine characters or you'd get these um these uh you know they get all these kind of like strange powerful decrepit characters or all these wonderful things and it was a kind of great to see how um, opening up these spaces meant that they could play with what it was to have an identity in the world um beyond the ones that they'd been maybe offered you know how to, how they could create their own identities well what do you think uh, maybe i miss a bit uh, how what was yeah. the device or the the way in which they could actually step into this different way of being creative was them putting a cloak on or was this something that you did with them so, I, so that activity would always happen within the container of one of these larger immersive stories. So there's a lot of like chasing down the rabbit hole of of the narrative of Terence, the super intelligent mouse, or or the Wonder Tree, or the City of Stories, or something. And and the and the work that then had already happened meant that new uh, new concepts of what of what a story could be had been opened up and yeah yeah, yeah. Basically, it did already set the kind of emotional environment to make that possible yes exactly uh, and i was curious now to ask you about this mini forest i can't i can't uh, uh, wait. yeah <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i mean a lot of my i i um deeply love the natural world and draw so much from it and as a kid was always running around under branches and uh, climbing trees and scrabbling and especially going down into the tiny worlds of stones and moss and lichen and all of these these things and over the over the pandemic i i lived in the countryside for a short while and made this very kind of renewed because i live in london i made this kind of renewed daily bond with the with the natural world in a way that i find quite difficult in the city and coming back to the city afterwards i found i really missed it um and i started to seek it out wherever i could find it and often that was the patches of moss 
or the the amazing patches of kind of growths of moss and lichen on the tops of brick walls uh or sort of crumbling bollards on the you know in roads and things and i started thinking of them as oh these tiny worlds and i got myself a little jeweler's loop which is a little magnifying glass and kind of zooming in on them so the mini forests was a show that emerged out of that me like following my curiosity and then learning more and more about these things the 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 kind of science of them uh so it's it's a show it's a it's a, a storytelling show with some simple puppets and uh and things that um that is about following the story of a scientist and she's investigating forests and then by chance one day something strange happens and she shrinks to the size of a grain of dust and ends up in a patch of moss and then she explores and discovers all these microscopic creatures the tardigrades and the rotifers and the the way that the moss protects itself from dry spells by closing up its leaves all these things start to play into this uh adventurous journey that she has through the moss trying to find a way to grow back up grow back to her normal size and return to the world um but it's a story which is very much about like about slowing down and being brave and curious and focusing in on on the the kind of worlds of wonder that are available to us everywhere and especially to the natural world how much the natural world has to offer us and to our imaginations um yeah anyway so that's yeah come come back to normal reality by the end of the story or is that yeah oh that's (laughs) kind of but this is interesting because children maybe i'm not sure about primary school but in general very interested in small things particularly Mm. i guess when they are small because that's where they can see better you know i have a nephew that is about two years old and and that's where he looks he just finds the most amazing things that you you don't even see yourself because that's where he's mostly looking in general but uh I I find it interesting where you said you were reading about the scientific aspect of that because of your own interest and then almost you digest them and then you re present them to children and this is something I also like to do because I think there is no thing that we cannot share with them if we just do it in a way that is shareable somehow definitely and it comes to this um this this thing of taking children's um intelligence seriously and and uh, and and meeting them with real your own your own true curiosity I mean um and what you're interested in and trusting that they'll be able to catch hold of it and be interested in it if you yeah as you say if you're able to present it in the right way um and i think that because uh this uh because this science the science behind this like tiny worlds is revealing something that's normally invisible uh it it has this very like story like quality to it and it's almost like the the fairy midwife and the ointment in the iron revealing a world that's there but you can't see and i think kids get that you know and so they're ready to go there with their with their imagination and 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 so then the science is intimidating it's like oh this is a oh of course this is a world that i can't see yeah Yeah, you can't see so you have to imagine it Mm. and the fact that even scientists have to imagine Mm. itself is a very interesting concept because also this or mostly they have been doing in the last i don't know ever centuries because they couldn't see they had to imagine (laughs) yeah yeah, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. It's the same work. <laughs> and I yeah. remember because I was looking at your website, one thing that uh, it was interesting to me was when you said that uh, we try to make a lot with the little, because mm. as educators or even parents, we might not have everything available, and but we still want to make the magic happen. And I wonder if you can talk us a little bit about that. How do you make a lot with the little? Mm. 
Um, how do you make a lot with a little? Well, in a way, by telling you the example of the video you made for the giant tag, I kind of guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, I yeah, definitely, and and always, I'm in in my work. I'm trying to use uh, leftover materials and and scrap materials, and then um, sustainable or materials that aren't costing the world too much. And then the processes are handmade and really accessible. And I have this uh, this concept of one beautiful thing. If you spend a lot of energy making one thing really beautiful, then people trust it. And everything else can be a little bit blue rolls and tinfoil. Not quite, but sort of. But but that that beautiful thing draws you in. Oh, I'm interested in this. I want to this is beautiful uh, but then the edges are all more accessible and more more penetrable oh i could i could do that mm. i could make this this is the world i could also create in my own time um that's a real principle for me i think and making things in a way and and never trying to hide how i've made something i let me let me grab a puppet for you okay yeah. well, i love puppets <laughs> Uh, yeah. Uh, can you still can you still hear me? I'm I'm just behind the camera. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. So I just <laughs> I like to. Um, this is from the mini forest show. Uh, this this creature is a nematode worm, mm -hmm. and the, when the nematode worm, when many of the creatures in the um, in the mini forest are dry, they they shrivel up. To protect themselves and enter cryptobiosis, a mysterious state of life that's close to death or sleep or something else and means they can survive for decades without enough water. Anyway, then when the water comes, they uh, they come back, <laughs> they emerge, <laughs> they grow, <laughs> and then and then they're there. Mm -hmm. And then um, and this is a this is this is the puppet, and I and the kids love this thing. They all want to meet it. And then after the show, I always invite them to come and see that it's made out of a, a piece of aluminium ducting that I found in a skip. And uh, and um, these are microphone covers that I got hold of, and bits of packaging, and some strange tubes, and some beads. And I always invite them to come and say, look. You could just stick some stuff together, and and then if you breathe a little magic into it, and a little story. Oh, nematode wants to uh, wants to say hello, and then then it can become something really special. And um, anyway, goodbye, nematode. <laughs> <laughs> it's been raining a lot today. That is why probably it got so long. All of a sudden. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <That's Yeah. okay. laughs> No, definitely. This is a fantastic yeah. advice because uh, also when I do my art classes, if mm -hmm. I do my normal thing, which of course I draw since 25 years, and clearly the level of my drawing skills are in a way that often they tell me, oh yeah, but I can never do that. Mm -hmm. So meeting them halfway somehow and they show you, I did that, but I did it this way. And so you can try and do the same, you know, in your own way. And so I think, but I like this. It's, it's almost like, I don't know why, but it made me think it's a good marketing strategy. Do something very well, beautiful and polished. And then the rest, it can be a little bit like... Yes. <laughs> but I, I know if this is, it wasn't what you meant, but I don't know in my head. <laughs> but it also speaks to, like, it's also because, you know, we're doing things in the arts and often budgets aren't enormous or i don't really work in the world of huge budgets they do exist but i don't tend to work in that world i don't tend to want to work in that world that has certain compromises that come with it that that some anyway so it's also about what can i do with the resources i have and often you might want to spread that all very thinly very evenly all over the place and you get everything mediocre yeah. but my the one beautiful thing is let's let's take us enough of that to make at least this that's really gorgeous that really sets the project on fire or, or to its to an to an to an extent and everything else then 
can ride on the trust that that builds. And, and with this attitude of collaboration, creative collaboration between your, between the artists and the audience, then they are on board with the idea of that this could be something and this could be something as well as this beautiful thing. Mm. And I, and I think cultivating that collaboration is about making the event, the storytelling, the workshop, the event, whatever it is, into a community event, a com even if it's just a community that only meets and exists for half an hour. It's a, it, we're a community, we're making something together and, and that's very powerful and, and often is helped by things being a little bit wonky around the edges because just like when Terence is suddenly not in the suitcase in Terence to the moon and we don't know what to do because Terence was supposed to tell the stories that the slightly broken bits where my expertise is punctured invites collaboration it, it invites collaboration I think I think yeah yeah which makes me think that uh a community can also be a family and mm -hmm. uh, and this ties in from the very beginning because this is what i think you were telling us a little bit about your young uh, you know when you were younger and then you were making all the things for your brother so that was a community already so you were doing already a community you were training <laughs> very early <laughs> So I'm thinking more like, you know, if a parent is listening now and he's trying to get some ideas or inspirations for how to get their children more into creativity or more like into storytelling or narrative adventures, this is a concept that uh, they could take on board. And another thing I was thinking as a parent, it might be, this is just a thought that I just had now I was listening to you, it might be difficult to keep the level of imaginative possibilities always so on because you know in the daily life with all the things we have to do sometimes parents can be very serious and so you know and as a, as a child I think if I remember when I was small I find it really hard this switch on and off of mm -hmm. these two ways of being you know like being serious and parents and then the other so I, I don't know if you have any thought about this I uh, definitely um and i and working with schools is maybe somewhat similar in that school has to maintain this serious kind of uh pursuit of learning uh things and 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 the creative freedom of anything all answers or right answers that you need in order to have this kind of imaginative uh occurrences sometimes runs counter to that and when i've worked in schools before um I'll use a device which um, which creates a container, an envelope for a period of time in which we all agree that that the normal uh, rules are suspended, and within it we have another agreement. So, in one uh, school project that I made called the Museum of Brave and Curious, the the school classes had a link to a little girl who was investigating a, a strange, surreal museum in a different world. And she needed them to give her advice of how to interact with it. And they had, um, in their classroom, each classroom that was participating had a suitcase which was sent to them. And so whenever the suitcase was out and open, and they were taking things in and out of it, that suitcase represented okay, we're in the world of brave and curious. And when we're in the world of brave and curious, there are no wrong answers. We listen to each other's ideas and whatever they are, we add to them. You know, these principles then are at play when the suitcase is here. And that, and that's, and then another project, it was a, a flashing light. When the flashing light is on, then we're in the world of the clockwork, the clockwork garden and, and this story that's happening. And so maybe it's, you know, for parents, it's something like um, having a totem, having a talisman of creativity. Um, and it could be it could be anything, but it's nice if it's a if it's a a rich object, what I would call a rich object. And a rich object is something that has a bit of let me go and grab something. Yeah, I'm really cool <laughs> not to know what a rich object is. I kind of have an idea. <laughs> I think it could be something that looks a bit special, not yeah. just a normal <laughs> but okay. 
So I, I, yes, definitely something that looks a bit special and that maybe looks like it has its own history that wasn't just made for you for this, you know, mm -hmm. but maybe has its own history. Like, let's say this rich object is this little box, uh, the shell box. Oh my goodness. And it's old and, and actually, um, it has one shell missing and, and why, you know? Where's why where's that gone? And then we open it up and we say, Oh, it has this little spade in it. Wait, wait, we can't see it because okay, yeah. Can you uh, see it? Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh why is this spade so tiny? And you know, but it's made of real brass. It's actually more like a coal shovel. So maybe it's for a tiny fire, and here it is in the shell box. And okay. So this is an interesting thing. And you could have it, oh, when the shell box is, is here and it's open, something magical is going to happen or I don't know. That's I really just like it. This is a fantastic advice. And also it makes me think that these rich objects are objects with questions. Yes, <laughs> the, definitely. Active storytelling, it, it, it involves questions and... Mm -hmm. And children have a lot of questions. <laughs> they, either they say them or they just don't don't say them, but they have them. You know, they, there's a lot of question marks in general. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And I think that comes to another another of these axioms, these phrases that I use, is uh, never ask a question you know the answer to. Mm. And you that's that can't always be true in the context of school. Let's say normal school, like we were just talking about, the normal context of school teachers have to ask questions that they know the answer to that's the point often but then within the context of once the suitcase is there the museum of brave and curious the teachers were part of you know we did some training with them part of that was try as far as possible to ask questions you don't know the answer to and you have to work a bit to seek those out but i don't know why the shell is missing so why is the shell missing? That's a question. That's a real question that I don't know the answer to. And we can then we can genuinely collaborate because as soon as children catch a whiff of um, you're playing guess what's in my head, yeah. you know, as soon as they catch a whiff of that, then they switch into a different mode where they're trying to get the right answer. Not not they're not digging around to try and find the possible. They're trying to find the correct. And that's a little different. And that and that's yeah, anyway. So objects that have questions contained in them or things that bring questions into the room that nobody knows the answer to are really useful. Yeah. This is a very deep and subtle concept anyway, what you just said. And I suppose that for the teacher it must have been really an interesting experience too, because uh, switching off from your role when you are in your job and just uh, discovering yourself in a different way, perhaps is also a thing that maybe stay I, I think it would stay with them even afterwards I don't know I've never done them and also it must come from your experience what you just said when you they sense a whiff of this game of you know I'm trying imagining what's in your head it, this this switching when you were telling us about it clearly you have seen it in their eyes clearly you have experienced that kind of breaking the, the magic somehow you know <laughs> And it happens in storytelling. If I if they sense that I know where this story needs to go, and and I've in the heat of you know in that because sometimes, like we said, you can't think that quickly. Sometimes I'll I'll ask, and what should they do next? And the kids know that I know what's going to happen next, and they then they don't want to answer, you know. And I go, oh, shouldn't have asked that question <laughs> because the. The wind comes out of the sails. You know, you're trying to keep the wind in the sails all the time. So everything's on the edge of chaos. And when you're sailing, you want to be on the edge of the wind taking over and the, <laughs> the boat. You know, you just that's what propels it. Yeah, um, uh, definitely one thing I'm going to take away from from today in my own practice, because, yeah, yeah definitely. Well, Yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, I was curious to ask uh, what you have uh, in your plans for the next future. Are you working on new things or are you planning to go in with some things in schools? Or So at the moment I'm doing a lot of work in 
in the public realm and I'm trying to find where where um where I bring patch larks to next I've been doing lots of stuff in public events and in libraries um and I'm spending this autumn and to festivals uh and I'm spending this autumn kind of investigating what other avenues there are for patch larks to move into and whether it's possible to find some funding and go into schools would be lovely for me i would love to do that so that's a kind of ambition um but at the moment we're popping up through east london uh telling stories and making up stories um at different events around there um yeah should people be able to know where you are a little bit in advance by going into your website or are uh, just more like surprise <laughs> appearances? <laughs> um, my uh, uh, my website's a good place to find out the kinds of things that we do, but the best place to find out where we're going to be um, is my Instagram account. Oh, and I okay. generally post things to uh, at Patchlarks on Instagram um with about a week's notice so people can see where we're going to be popping up what kind of events we're going to be doing and yeah oh, fantastic so i'll make sure that i i add this to the link so people can know where where you're going to be and uh, where they can meet you as well yeah yeah and i love it when people come and uh have a chat <laughs> yeah absolutely well I think that we I have asked you the, um, more, almost all of the questions that I had in my mind. <laughs> I'm okay. sure there would be many more things that we could talk about because I saw in your website that you did something about maps and that would be also another. But I wonder if maybe we are a bit short of time. So, yeah, maybe we leave people explore the map, the family maps on your website. <laughs> or do you want to tell us a little bit about, do you have a second, a little bit more time? Yes, definitely. Um, yes, yeah, so the map about the giant that is sleeping. Someone needed uh, box. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, that was such a nice project that I made for Royal Docks, which is uh, so the Royal Docks in London. There's a team that are uh, and a fund that's been uh, pushing cultural uh, kind of energy into that area for a few years. And I made a, uh, a a project with them, which was a which is uh, a map that you can use to explore the area and meet some of the things and find imaginative stories about some of the important kind of landmarks around there. The Sleeping Giant is uh, is actually the Thames Barrier. It's a nickname for the Thames Barrier, which protects London. It's a, it's kind of uh, across. It's quite iconic, but it's across the Thames in that area, and it protects London from uh, flash floods and and uh, and the rising sea levels and so on. Uh, and, and, and other things. <laughs> sorry? And sea monsters and all and of that. <laughs> <laughs> definitely sea monsters. But it's really a beautiful name because there's a lot of sleeping giants in British mythology and I don't know, it has this very, this, it has this interesting quality. But is uh, this the name that you gave or is the name that people know these things? Uh, yeah, so no, it's a, it's a name that, uh, is a nickname it already has. Ah. Uh, yeah, and I, so I love, I love going into an area and, and digging out the stories or even just a, a hint of a story and then going, let's make that into a full, a whole story. <laughs> yeah, that must uh, be part of your architectural past, digging into stories of, of places. <laughs> yeah, it must be. Yeah, definitely. But and and places that, are so rich. Mm. Yeah, I saw that people can actually get the map from your website. Is it correct? Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, you can download it still. Um, yes, and I have, so I, I, um also have an illustration practice that sometimes is on the back burner but um yeah so i illustrate the maps and and uh, write the content for them um which is a really which is really nice because you can kind of with the you can tell the story and then with the illustrations you can bring it into this more imaginative realm yeah i think it can really help to build the world if you have that extra skill that you can help your storytelling isn't it mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. 
Fantastic. Is there is there any, anything else you'd like to add that you'd like to say to us or yeah yeah I think as adults so back to the Linda Barry thing of we reach a certain point and we think oh I can't do this because we have our expectations start getting set by external standards which which we if we're not an expert in that thing we haven't reached that standard let's say and so then we kind of put it aside because I think as adults we're easily embarrassed uh you know our social sophistication kicks in and we start to to easily be embarrassed or or uh yeah something like embarrassed I think it's really powerful for children to see us just making the attempt at uh creative play and um, I love, I do a drawing workshop um, uh, called uh, called the Cartographer's Workshop. And we make a, a map of islands or kingdoms or different kinds of things together on one big piece of paper. And I try and encourage the parents to come and join in, no matter what their level of skill. And just... It's more about expressing some ideas. Oh, I'm making avocado island and everything's green and smushy. What, you know, what, what does that mean? And there's a, and, and it's really useful to use labeling. I do this with five-year-olds who've drawn a, a squirrel like this. Wow, tell me about it. What's this? Oh, that's its face and it's got long teeth. And you can't see that, but yeah, there it is. Draw a little arrow face with long teeth. You know, and you can do it for yourself as an adult. I'm, I'm trying to draw this, but now I can use words to kind of lift it up. And anyway, I'm rambling, but I think that 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 the working alongside, so not tr not helping the kids, but doing the same process as the kids, and being brave about not being good at it, is really powerful, and really lets the child know that there it's a, a permissible. Mm -hmm. to carry your imaginative and creative life into adulthood and that's mm -hmm. such a gift yes I agree with you because when I was small my parents never played with us because my dad was mm -hmm. always working and I think it stayed with me as a negative kind of you know as a, I can't play when I'm grown up and it's so terrible I think <laughs> also because you need creativity and imagination in the adult world as much as you need it when you're small to totally and more and more so i think um in this world uh and i think yeah that's exactly that as adults we're modeling uh what it is to be a fully formed human to our children and to the children that we encounter and it and we they deserve us to model a a a a, 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 a way of being human that includes the full breadth of what's possible you know yeah i was thinking about maps because i saw you were making a lot and do you did you ever come across these maps where they have emotions instead of places in them i yeah. i said where is that book I, I got the idea from a book about a chap that is from the u.s it's called brad montague and he follows the um, fred rogers um, kind of approach and he made this map where there were so there were mountains there were deserts and lakes and island but for example it was the island of happiness the mountains of the cliffs of anxiety or the desert of boredom the clouds of worry or something and I found the children a bit intimidated at the first when I presented this because I made my own but at the same time, some of them were quite intrigued and very willing to add to the map their own ideas of things. Yeah, like the clouds I didn't put. And it was a little girl who said, oh, when I cry, we must put some clouds because when I cry, it's raining. Mm, yes. Yeah. Gorgeous. And that's the, um, you know, back to the Har Hannah Arendt uh, Story stories have the power to reveal meaning without making the mistake of defining it. You, the the container of this is a world in which emotions are places. That's a story to me. That's a story, and we're all playing with the story. And it means that you can, you know, Emily Dickinson's thing of come at it slant. Uh, you can you can go to these 
as you know the potentially intimidating territory of like this is the volcano of anger but it's contained in a, in a way that means that you can just approach it with imagination and curiosity without getting too caught up in the reality of it and then you can maybe have some great conversations or great explorations yes that that, that have safe limits and have safe boundaries and i think that's yeah that's part and of that, that i think once i was talking with a parent and we have the, we had this idea that she could have it in her house and the child could have like a little icon that she placed wherever she felt that day you know mm. to come in next day i'm there yeah that's fantastic yeah. So thanks a lot for your time. It has been really inspiring to talk to you. Oh. I hope that one day I can come to the mainland for leaving my little green island, which is getting more and more difficult given the prices of the ferries, and just come to one of your events. <laughs> oh, I would love that. Yeah, it would be and so nice. South, let me know because you know, <laughs> you know, when the <laughs> white is not that far after all. <laughs> <laughs> just a giant leap from the mainland. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you, Oliver. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you, Lucia. Well, this was such a rich and inspiring conversation. And I'm sure you will agree with me that Oliver has the true skill of conjuring magic with his words. During the interview, I was completely transported into a world where everything was possible. And as Oliver, I also believe that this attitude is key to lift the quality of our lives. The principle of the one beautiful thing and the rich totem that opens the portal to the world of imagination are ideas that I truly will take on my journey as a creative educator. So, I will leave all the interesting links in the show notes together with Oliver's website and Instagram page. And if you know of any little creatives who love nature and art, I am in the process of moving all my Patreon for Kids content on YouTube so that more children can enjoy it. So thanks for listening and until next time, make sure to take your imagination into the everyday life.